Uh, the project that you did with Illusionist was actually the first one, right? That you did with a exterior company. So how was the experience of filming a full-fledged project? It was really, really good, really intense as well. Because, you know, like you have to pack together all the material and film it. And like, typically it's like one day of like filming and being very present and keeping the energy fresh, which is not easy. Um, but it, it was great. It was really nice. And, you know, I, I do a lot of filming with my magic as well for Instagram, for my independent projects as well. So I think it was very, very good to see an actual, like, professional camera guy filming the magic. Like, no, Dwayne is the guy who filmed the project. And he is really, like, the guy behind the scenes and, you know, like, most of Illusionist camera work. Um, and he did a brilliant job and I, and I loved it on that day because I was like, wow, that is such a clever thing to do. Like all the camera angles and everything. Um, so that's, that was really a thing. It's sort of, um, I still remember. And this is also because I, I do film a lot of my magic myself as well. Um, but the project was, was really good. It was really cool. And it was a very nice experience as the first time to have a chance to put together my material for a very specific project you know because cool. a lot of times when creating magic um especially in those years i was younger and a lot of the stuff that i was creating it was not really you know like organized i, I do create here and there and then a lot of the content is like scattered throughout my creations but having those projects really allow you to just draw a line and just look at what you have take the best out of it and sort of package it in a way that can be helpful to other magicians as well. And I think this is the most important thing. There is so magic in the market right now, you know, that it is so important when releasing something to know that, you know, like you need to be aware of what you're doing. So you're trying to package some of your stuff into something that can be really worth for other people. And um, that was that was the challenge. And, you know, like people loved it, like people loved it. And so many people got in touch and has um, yeah. great reviews. So I, I think, you know, in, in a way we achieved it. Um, that, that was done, you know. One of your personal projects that you did was uh, Tricks for Thought. And inside of it, you, you had like 20 tips, 20 things that you learned about magic. And one of the things that you said there was that before releasing something, you should really ask yourself like, if this is what you want to put out in the magic world. Mm -hmm. So what, I'm at, what I want to ask you is, when do you know that something that you've created is ready to be published? Well, it's, um, it's a strange question. Like it's, it, in, a, in a sense, it's, like, it's a very important question, but I, I think the answer is very... Um, it's pretty much always changing depending on the moment of your life, uh, how you're doing magic, sort of what is your purpose by doing magic and what the opportunities are that you get. Um, and this is for, for, for multiple reasons. Now, as a general rule, I think the moment you, you really feel like you sort of are ready to put something out is the moment where you decide you want to stop working on it and you say, like, that's it, I do it. And I'm saying this because I, I really think there's no limit in all the work that you can do to tricks, to magic, to moves and theories and all of that. It's an infinite journey, potentially. Like, if, if you don't stop doing it, like there's always going to be new ideas that can improve what you've done in the past. Right now, I'm looking at material I have done uh, like five or six years ago, and I'm like, wow, that's not the way I would do it now. Or... Some of the things, maybe I just don't like them anymore. And I'm like, why? Why did I do that? Um, but, but, you know, like, I knew that at the time that was the right thing to do. And that was my mindset. And doing that allowed me to change and improve and today become the person I am. And the things I'm doing today, they will make me the person I'm going to be, whatever. I think in, in this way, it's, it's a great lesson of, like, growing up. Um, but you need to be very aware of what you're doing. You know, you need to be very aware that I'm I'm releasing something. And um, I mean, like, I know maybe some people just do it for the money, whatever. 
but I, I, I feel like there is a, there is something more behind it, you know, than just doing it for the business. It's, it's more of a magic to me is an art form. It's something deeper. It means a lot to me. The time I spend with, with cards is that my thing is, is very precious and it's always been a very deep thing. And so in my opinion is like, I have an idea. I'm trying to put all my time and effort into it. Like, do the best I can to turn that into something real. Then I give it to people. And eventually, you know, like many other magicians say this. So, but I, but I think the same, which is the moment you give something to the community, that is just the starting point of what that is then going to be, you know? So in a sense, it's, um, it's a never ending path. It's a really a never ending path. At one point you need to give yourself a limitation and say, okay, that's it. I'm not going to work anymore on this. And I mean, just stop, you release it, and that's it. I, I, I don't really think that there's ever a trick or, um, or anything in, in magic that at one point you can really say, this cannot be improved anymore. That's true. You know? true. Uh, one thing that I've noticed while going through your Instagram, uh, over the years, your performance has gotten much more uh, emotional, much more... Uh, personal intimate that's the word that i was searching for it feels much more magical and this is one of the things that you you talk about in um, in tricks for thought or not even am i saying it nice is it tricks for thought it's tricks for thought right yeah tricks for thoughts yeah You're talking about the difference between a, a card trick and magic so what i want to ask you is how can you turn a card trick into something that is magical Oh, that, How do you do? This doesn't sound like an easy question to ask. <laughs> this is not easy. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I used to have lots of ideas about this, and I and I still have lots of ideas. It's surprising how much they change, though, and how much I'm changing throughout these ideas. Which 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 I always feel like a positive thing. I think changing is always is always good um you're right my my performance style in a sense got more intimate over time i think it's because i found out i i like it of course and also it's something that i can naturally do well in a sense i don't know maybe maybe it's just me thinking of this but um it's something that you know it's sort of my inner thing that i can do um, then of course, when you when you grow up and learn more into magic, as with any other art form, you can learn new principles and learn how to be a different character as well. For instance, I have a very hard time when it comes to being like a funny character. You know, like me as a person, I'm I'm sort of a you no, know, I wouldn't say funny person, but I'm I'm kind of like. And I'm Italian, I'm moving my hands so you can tell, but I, I'm like, I, I make jokes, I'm, I'm a bit silly, but when it comes to magic, I naturally sort of switch to being more relaxed and creating something like more intimate with people. And I think that, I don't know why, there's sort of something clicks. And to me, that is uh, something very natural. So I expect that in some years I will change because hopefully I will learn uh, new ways of presenting myself new new possibilities for my character into magic but right now that is sort of something that really clicks um so that that being said um how to turn just the card trick into magic now i remember when i was writing that thing for tricks for thoughts and it's nice that you that you remember that it's it's very cool it was it was um it was three or four three four three years ago it was three years ago and I was writing that and I think there was a line that was something like um, talking about the magical experience. Is your double lift more magical than the Lord of the Rings in a sense? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it, it, it was a bit like, you know, like a bit of thought throwing there, but, 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 but that's the point really. It's um, so what is it that it is magic? Like magic is a feeling. It's um, it's not something that you can see, not something that you can hear. Like if you, if you remove some of the senses from a magic experience, you can still create the magic. And I remember the point I was making within that project was, if you think of, you know, uh, music, the core element of music is a sound. If you leave the sound out, there's no music. If you think of photography, for instance, or painting, uh, it is about what you can see. It's like, you know, it's about the eyes, the, the visual 
um, stimulus in a way. So if you remove that, you remove photography, you remove painting. Um, but with magic, the thing is, you can have a trick that works for blind people. If you have a trick that works with the weight of an object, and you're lifting and moving, that's already something. Or, or it's a trick that you have with your ears. You can have a trick with a smell. Or you can remove senses and still be able to come up with magical experience, which which makes you think that probably it's not really about one of the senses. It's more of an experience. It's it's more of a feeling you get, like wonder, surprise. It is a feeling, you know, and, and that is the core of magic. So in, in my mind, like the way to turn a trick, a puzzle into magic is when you can get to that feeling which is naturally something that is almost impossible to sort of measure and to double check like you cannot really perform and be like so did you feel that like did you feel that magic thing <laughs> like when when is the last time you felt wonder is it like having some deep chats with friends watching the night sky with stars all around going to a concert of your favorite artists and singing all around with people like some of that that is where the magic is. And that magic is better than any trick we can do. But if you can sort of, you know, if you can recollect that feeling and if you can sort of put it into your performances, you are trying to do magic. Then doing magic is, is I don't know, like I'm, I'm 26. I'm still young. I have lots of stuff to learn. And I, and I, and I feel like there's, there, there are lots of things sort of to improve. But if if I want to try to do magic, if a magician wants to try to do magic, I think the thing is sort of focus on that feeling, what it means for you, and just try and to put it in your performances. When was the first time that you felt this wonder from seeing uh, <laughs> magic? Wow. Um, that is tricky. Um, there are many times, really. But name one, Darren Brown's show. Been to Darren's show, loved it. Felt like magic. Felt like the thing that hits. This is from magic, yeah. you know. Um, I, I I need to say like, I think, I think some of the best moments you can get them outside of magic, and you can sort of collect like that moment we're watching at the sky and listening to music like that is sort of the thing that commonly gets. Um, with, with magic, it's, it's, it's very hard as a magician as well to feel that when you're watching some magic, because it's, it's inevitable. Like if you watch a magic trick now, your brain automatically goes to like, Ooh, the method, Ooh, the touches, the subtleties, <laughs> the presentation. So it's, it's very hard to sort of let go and like switch off the brain and enjoy the moment. But Darren's show, I love it. And I need to say most of that um beauty i get it from uh magic that is not the magic that i do simply because the less i know about an area of magic the more i can enjoy it so stage magic all the levitations the big illusions like i'm, I'm still fooled by by some stuff yeah. that other people say it's basic <laughs> you know? yeah, I, love that. I, I do that as well i like that you know well, well, well if i'm watching a magic trick with with cards if i'm watching a card trick all the time i'm like Oh, look at that. I think I've seen that before. Like I could do this and that and change it. So it's um it's inevitable in a way, you know. <laughs> Tell me what are your five to go tricks? My five to go tricks, right. Yeah. Um card revelation and out of this world, wiki task, torn and restored, and finally the voodoo card. I love voodoo cards. I love tricks with uh, playing cards and fire. And I love tricks that end with something impossible that pe people can keep. Yeah. So yeah. if I have to like perform to a friend or something, so it's sort of a very impromptu performance, I start by doing something very easy, such as, you know, pick a card and reveal it. And sort of I tend to play revelations differently each time so that I'm trying new things each time. But that is the moment when I try and get um, intimate, in a sense. I go straight into that, like looking at the person in their eyes and trying to create a connection with that. Um, and then going, hopefully, to a trick with fire and ending with out of this world. This is a thing I've done a lot, um, but I very often change. So, 
So voodoo fire out of this world. I see such a mystical connection. Ah! <laughs> All of these, honestly. Love it. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's um. There are some aspects, you know, in in the magic, like. I love magic that is about them and not about me. So every time I can make the trick about them, I'm always happy. I don't want to handle cards. I don't want to show off techniques um, or cardistry or anything like that. Not because I don't like that. Like I spend so much time with techniques, but the less techniques I use, the happier I am um, because I want them to hold the cards and to do the things, to have something at the end. So Tricks that they do, such as out of this world, dealing the cards and doing the work, that is great. Impossible objects, such as the voodoo card that's burnt and ripped at the end, that, you know, that is what you want. So that's it. You actually ended up um, having a lecture for Ollie, right? At the Ollie hour? Yeah. Later. So uh, you had a lecture in 2016 for the first time. And then you, if I, that's how I uh, remember correctly. Let me see here. You did so, so much. You did lots of researching. <laughs> you had one in 2018 in London. And then you had one for the Ollie Hour in 2020. And I was curious, I was curious about how you, what you learned from lecturing for magicians and how you structure your lecture. And if you can share your experience for other people watching this that will, are also thinking about lecturing as well? I think the best thing you can do when lecturing for magicians, I'll just go straight into the main point, is leaving them with the joy of loving magic. Um, this is my main point I'm making. Then, of course, there are the tricks. All the tricks you can do, that, that you can explain, that they can learn and hopefully do. But the point with magicians is they see so much magic and... Um, Maybe they see so many lectures and at one point it's impossible for them to just do all the things they learn. So yeah. I think, you know, like the main thing you can give to a magician is a sort of a reminder of how much they love magic. And I hope this doesn't sound like an easy thing to say. Like it, it took me years to sort of get to this, to this feeling not only for my lectures, but also I've been traveling a lot around Italy, translating lectures for other magicians in the past. I did it for Oli Meeling, for Tom Elderfield. Recently, I did it for Tobias Dostal. Like, we did some lovely travelings and, you know, like touring together. And um, I was, you know, like doing all the translation and all of that. Because, you know, like Italy is, is, a, is a weird place if you do not speak the language. And... By watching the lectures and by watching other lectures as well, of course, at conventions and all of that, you really realize that regardless of if the people are actually using the tricks you're teaching, the best gift you can give them is that huge feeling again. Because they are magicians. They go to their club every week. They virtually have a, you know, like a lecture every week. If they don't have a lecture every week, they can go on... A, on a website right now and buy some magic easy and they learn magic so they have so many ways to learn magic so why did they go to their club why did they go to their lecture because it because it's like there's a contact with the people there's a contact with the artists it's a it's an experience that goes beyond the magic so i think the best thing you can do is acknowledge that and treat that as an experience and bring the magic to the table and to the feeling okay so i think that is the best thing and the happiest people i've seen after lectures all that, and i'm talking of like many different lectures from other people and different styles that i've seen the happiest people were after lectures where they sort of found again that joy of like this is why i love magic this is why i'm joining this club this is why i'm coming here this week so this is the main point then there are the tricks. If the tricks are bad, your lecture is bad. <laughs> you know, you cannot get out of this. You can be a fantastic, yeah. phenomenal, beautiful person, but if your tricks are bad, of course, the lecture is not going to be good. So you need the good tricks. You need the good tricks. You need them in the right order. You need to sort of bring people in your world. I think if, you know, I, I love it when a lecturer has a very distinct style you know, so it's not like a lecturer that's trying to um, be likable for everyone. So it's like trying to do a lot of everything or 
is not like you cannot really tell the personality of the person. I I love when you see like the person on stage and the personality shines through that person and it's doing great tricks and the tricks are different to what you normally see. Um, that is it. And of course, the last thing, which um, is a bit, you know, um, not really obvious, but it's one of the very first things you learn when lecturing. The worst thing you can do in a lecture, I think, is show a trick with uh, 20 different slides and 14 new applications. And then this is the first trick of the lecture and people are like, what? So, of course, I, I think there are some tricks that are good for lectures. And those are tricks that if I'm sitting and watching you, I'm not going crazy on I'm not following the techniques. You know, um, that's yeah. the thing. At the same time, though, I've seen great technicians doing great lectures about technique that, however, were great because of the subtleties in each technique. And so you can sort of pick up the subtleties and then it's like, okay, I'm going to include this to what I am ready to do, you know. So I think there's, um, there, there's a lot of thinking when, when it comes to creating a lecture. It's not just I'm showing off my best material. I think there is more, you know. So what do you believe, uh, as you briefly mentioned that it's not just about fitting in as many tricks as possible. And uh, you've also talked about this uh, in, in, your, in your posts, in your videos, and in your uh, material, that it's not, doing, it's not about doing as many tricks as possible to somebody that wants to see magic. So from your point of view, what is the right amount of tricks to perform to somebody and um when do you know you should stop performing <laughs> oh wow um it's funny because i know like most of the things i'm saying i'm probably i'm probably changed my mind over time and over time i mean in a matter of weeks not just years but if i but, but i have some like core principles that that I keep going and I, and I feel like some of them, I'm, I'm not giving up on them. And one thing I wrote three years ago on that project on Truths for Thoughts was, um, do you want to know like when to stop doing magic? It's when they want one more trick. That's when you stop. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that that is the best way to put it, the best phrase, you know, for it. But, see it like this, like you go to a concert, like I, I love concerts, I love music, I go to concerts, I love them, I'm a big fan of so many concerts, like I love them. You go to a concert and you watch the concert and it's very rare that at the end of the concert you're like, wow, that was it, I'm very happy, I don't want any more songs from this guy, I'm happy I can <laughs> go in my car, drive three hours, go back home and I'm happy. You go to a concert, the concert is over, and you're like, no, I, they didn't play this one song. One more song. Why not? One more, but the concert is over. And, you know, I think if, if you're happy the concert is over, it means you didn't like the music. You know, so yeah. I, I think it's, I think that is, that is something to keep in mind. And... When you go watch Darren Brown's show, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with Darren because I, I feel like it's a performer that many people have seen and because we had mentioned him earlier. When you go watch him show, like his show is long. It's like two hours and 30. It's long. So much is packed inside the show, but the show is over. And the first thing you want to do is go tomorrow to go watch the show again because of the feeling, because it's like, I want to try, I, I need one more dose of that, you know? So I think that is a great lesson to learn. And it's sort of, you need to give them the feeling, but then in one point you need to leave them with the desire. And if, if you do so, then the experience is, gonna, is sort of going to expand. Then at one point you're going to forget, but if you love the concert and if you wish the concert was longer, if you wish they played a few more songs, and you drive back home singing the song with your friends. The day after, you put your headphones and you listen to the songs again. So the experience is still going inside you. It's like, at one point, you need to stop it there and let the thing live within them, in a way. 
I think that is, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if it is, but that might be a sign of like, it's also like being humble with your, with, with your doing. You, you, cause otherwise, like you, your persona, you're sort of overshadowing what you're doing. It's like, they want one more. They want me. They want me. Here I am. Like, cause in a sense, like, a lot of the casual performances we do as magicians, they're not really like organized in a precise set of tricks. So we start doing a trick, we do one more, we do one more, we do one more. At one point, 40 minutes later, we're like, oops, I probably should have stopped. And, uh, you know, it's like, because we, because we love it, because it, it, it also makes us as performers feel great, because that's why we do magic as well. Um, but we need to remember it's for them, not for us, you know. Um, so, so I think there's a lesson to learn in that concept metaphor and i need to say i haven't invented it right now it's something i i have thought, <laughs> i have thought recently about um i don't remember why but i but i was like thinking about this recently beautiful i love it man thank you <laughs> i love it i love your philosophy tell me how what do you do when you fail if you fail a trick right? <laughs> tell me what you do. yeah 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 well, of course, you know, like the easy thing, you try and find a backup. And um, a lot of times if, um, if, um, if, if you are very aware of your, of your tools and um, if you are comfortable with the environment, with the people, there are many ways to find a backup. So many ways to sort of um, find the way out. And doing some improv work as well can also help so much, um, you know, like trying sort of find ways to to have outs um otherwise if you cannot do that um you know i think in a way it's um so he he, here it just is about what kind of performer you are because if you are a very grand performer who's like presenting himself as um I'm never failing. I never fail. And it's sort of like, it's very committed to this. And then the fail is massive. That is, that is weird. It's, it's, it's very hard. They're going to believe you can do that, you know, but if regardless of the kind of performer you are, if either you don't take yourself too seriously or you are a person before being a magician, then even if you fail, we all fail at work. We all do that. The people coming here tonight, they had a day at work. Maybe it wasn't the best day. Maybe they did some mistakes. Maybe, you know, like, so why can I? Why can't I? And of course, it's not something you should say if you're like, here's your card. Oh, and yeah, I do mistakes at work. Just pay me my beer. It's like, no, you don't have to say that. But, but again, think of Darren. Like, he's doing the big bantle thing. He's being, he, he can be so serious and so, um, he can make you feel quite scared at times, but also he's so human. At the end, he's so human. He smiles and laughs and, 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 and you can see so many light, um, segments in his shows as well. And it's like, that is when the person shines through. And if, if you make a mistake, it's a mistake. What's wrong? Like, you know, <laughs> I, I have a bear story. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, I think it was one Tamaris who said for a trick um, that each night he was hoping for the trick to go, to go wrong. Was really hoping for a few reasons. Like, if the trick goes wrong, you're very happy. So he's like, you know, Juan, he's like, ah! <laughs> so he's like, he's very happy because he was hoping for the trick to go wrong. And also because you know, you know, then he can work out um, the ways out, and he can be more prepared the next time. So it's um, it's a lot about that, you know. It's um, it's a lot about that. It's uh, first and foremost about what kind of um, relationship you have with your mistakes, and uh, what kind of character are you, and uh, how is your character going through mistakes in life. Um, and that is what people will expect. Let's uh, let's further let's go away from uh, performing for a bit, and tell me how you create a new idea. How do you come up with ideas these days? So I, I actually have um, 
very like a precise way, but quite precise. So I'm not just going at random. Um, and this came over time. So you have a starting point, and the starting point is the idea for the trick. Uh, like it's highly recommended, highly recommended to never start from a method. And um, at one point, this can either sound very obvious or very strange, depending on sort of the background a magician has. Um, when I was starting magic, of course, I was just, you know, like learning the moves, the double lift, Amsley counts, learning all that, all that. And then the first thing you want to do is, I want to have a trick to perform with that move. And, and that's fine when you're starting out, um, you know, like coming up with tricks or exploring tricks. And, and, I, and I already was coming up with so many tricks already when I was starting magic because my mind is sort of like, I need to create. Um, but then over time, the, the, there needs to be a point where you realize you cannot keep going like that. You need to change. Um, and that is the moment you need to realize you, it's, it's always better to start from the effect. Um, so you need to start from an effect idea and an effect idea uh, can be anything. You can start from a plot that's famous in magic, such as oil and water. You can start from um, an object, such as a deck of cards with a hole inside. I don't know why. You can start yeah. from, from an image, such as, um, uh, I don't know, a person holding a card and the card is sort of turning by itself. You can start from a line, such as, um, uh, I don't know, uh, such as this deck of cards is not what it seems. You can start from anything. So there are many starting points. I'm not really the most visual person. Like, I'm more a sort of a brain person. So a lot of the times I start from um, lines, phrases, or, or things in my mind that make sense and that I connect them to an image. Or I start with an image, but like it's, it's always like starting from those directions. So that is the starting point. And then you're sort of trying to find out what there is around it. You know, like in video games where you have the map and the, 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 the character starts at the center of the map and you know there's black areas around and you have to sort of explore them. And the more you explore them, the more you find out. I think that is, that is similar to what that is. So the starting point can be something. Can be a plot, can be a vision, can a vision. It's like a visual thing. Can be a vision. <laughs> can be a phrase, a presentational idea. And you're at the center of the map. And you can leave it there. The map is always going to be there. One day you can come back, open the notebook, and it's like, oh wow, so the deck of cards with an all inside. Let's let's play this map. Or or you can play it now. And if you play it now, you you done explore new things. And I think the way you explore them really depends on who you are in that moment. What's your mood? What's is around you? What time of your life? So then you explore and you and you try to come up with the effect. So a deck of cards with an all inside can be because you know like the, the coin with the finger can be like that. I'm just pushing the fingers inside, or or can be because I'm putting something very heavy and the card sort of collapse, or can be because I'm blowing and the card changes. Or can be because I'm tearing one and then I'm looking down and the entire deck is torn in the middle. So it can be all of that. So you can you can sort of finding um, so many ways to, 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 to make it happen. And I think that is the moment when you need to have limitations. Like um, you need to have restrictions. If you do not have restrictions, it's virtually impossible to create a trick. Um, even if you ask the, better, the best creator in the world and it's like white, white paper and it's like create a trick. He's going to be like, what? Like, what am I creating this trick for? What are the items? What kind of methods should I use? How much time do I have? What is the budget? And the same goes here. Even if it's just card tricks and the budget is likely going to be a bicycle deck, <laughs> you know, it's, um, you need to have restrictions. So in my case, sometimes they are, is it for camera? Is it for live performances? Do I want this to use just a normal deck of cards? Do I want to fool magicians with, with this trick? Um, do I want this trick to be very quick or do I want it to be longer? Do I want it to have a long setup or not? So you, you sort of find restrictions and, and then you explore the map navigating through the restrictions you have. And at one point you end up having sort of, you, you start with the idea of a trick, which for instance is a hole in the middle. And I don't know, I'm just 
taking the card, folding, tearing the center. Now there's a hole. I'm looking down and that's the hole there missing. So that's the fact idea. If I know I'm performing this for camera, maybe I can have, you know, like I can freeze some part of the screen and have someone change. I can have, um, I know, I don't know, I can um, switch that in some way. I can play with the perspective so they get to see this, but it's not. I can play with all sorts of things. If I'm doing it for live performances, they need to probably have a flap here and the, the center is never going to be anything and then the flap collapses, whatever. So then you navigate that and you come up with a method. And then at that point, if you do not have the presentation already, you need to have the presentation. And I've been so lazy for a long time, like, oh, I don't need presentation, I can improvise. But then I, but but then you you realize when when you see magicians that really have worked in their presentations, you realize that that is that is it. Like that is what you need to do. You need to stop having cards in your hands, go for a walk, and take notes and write down the script and remember the script word by word and practice it and change the tone and add the poses. And you need to do that. So that is one thing important. And then at the end, one thing that I love including, which is sort of my thing, um, and kind of um, my friends love this thing that I uh, sort of do, which is adding the little touches. I love little touches. And uh, little touches, in my mind, is um, something that doesn't change anything in terms of the method, but changes so much for the effect. So I have a trick, which is the butterfly effect, um, which is a triumph effect. Um, and it's based on the presentation of the butterfly effect. So when a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, um, and then you have a storm that's breaking out in another part of the world, whatever. And at one point, I'm just taking the card and I'm doing this. You know, just, just mimicking the butterfly at one point of the trick. And it's the point where there's, it's supposed to be the big revelation. And I'm just posing there. I'm picking a card. The card means nothing. And it's not going to be nothing. But I'm just doing this. And then I leave the card down. And then the orientation of this card will dictate the orientation of all the other cards. Um, and that is just a little touch. The method is, what? It's not the method. I'm just moving my indexes. But, but that's a little touch. And the experience for them it's now all of a sudden different. Um, if you want, we can talk about little touches a bit more. I, because I, I have a few more things, but I, I don't want to steal all the time to talk about that. So, but that I wanted to say, it's it's sort of the last step of the process, and to me, it's probably the most important. While we're at uh, creating magic, do you have anything to teach people watching? Yeah, it's it's, it's again about little touches, maybe. Um, Perfect. It can be also about subtleties. I'm just keeping the camera down so you can see. Um, yep. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this thing. Um, one thing I was doing a lot uh, years ago was this. So let's say I have a deck of cards, no breaks, nothing. And I just ask them, or I do, I just cut to a random position. Here's your card. And that's it. And then I let some time pass. And when I come back to this moment, I'm like, oh, no. I'm off my one. It's not this one. It's this one. Okay. I was one off. This is not your card. Okay. That's good. That's good. One off. Okay. We can now see. What is your card? This is, this is the card, the Ace of Hearts. So it's, um, really, it's a little touch. It's, it's self working. It's, it's a cross cut force. The card has always been here. So normally the cross cut force is you leave the cards here and these, you leave them in a weird angle. But, but to me, it was like, if I, if I'm doing this and committing to a card, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and committing to a card in a very fair way, like this. And then some time is in between. And then I'm changing this for this one. Then, you know, it's, it, it's just a little change, but you're doing a force. And a few more things. I was playing so much with these things, such as also for, for, from the top, like doing this to cut a card from the middle, which is actually again you know like coming from the top it's just a slip cut but again if you can frame it in in a way that feels like the card is coming from the middle or even this such as i'm looking for a card it's somewhere around the middle it's probably around 
in between these two packets is around right here. I'm not going to touch. And again, you're doing it with the bottom card, really. You're just doing this, but it's 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 in the flow. So I used to have a routine. There, there's a video of that. I'm going to send. I used to have a routine where I was doing the three the three aces um, with with these three methods. So I was cutting to the first one here. The second one was done in that way, and the third one came from the bottom. And they matched uh, with the card they they picked at the start. So that is about little touches. But I love little touches with so many slides. Like one control that I do a lot is um, is the Marlow tilt. And one thing that I always do is uh, when the card is in the middle, I do this, you know, um, which which I love. And then the card is here, uh, which is again, you know, like I'm sure most people are familiar with the Marlow tilt. It's just about like lifting some cards from the middle. When, when you push the card in. So you're here and you're, you're just lifting the cards in the middle. Um, all these little touches, I'm a big, big, big fan of of these things. Yeah, really. Like, um, I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm going to send you that 4 Ace production video because um, that is a thing I love. Um, and, and, and I love all the card slides that feel illogical, such as this force as well. I'm, I love this force so much, such as you say, stop right here. And we're going to yep. use this card, the queen of diamonds. Again, this is a very illogical move. The card starts from the bottom. The moment you say stop, you're here. You're going to peel the card from the bottom and turn it over. Um, but not in the flow. It's this, not in the flow. It's, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it looks sort of natural. Like I'm, I'm very happy with these little touches. Um, one more, one more, um, which is this one again. This, this, this doesn't change the method, but changes in the sort of the the framing of what you're doing. Um, let's say this is the card. They select the three of clubs. We're gonna leave it in the middle. Actually, gonna push it there. It's there square in the card is on top um and again here is more by adding one more packet sort of you're here of course what i'm doing is i'm leaving two cards i'm not just leaving the five space i'm leaving the five in the card that's just on top of it so i'm leaving two cards which means this card which is now sort of side jogged is is not the five leaving here placing this card and now what i'm doing is i'm not doing this when I'm spreading again, I'm pushing this to them, closer to them, and then I'm putting this and putting this, which feels more like the card is there, the cards are not shuffled, the cards are shuffled, are not touched, and then everything is squared, and, and still you have full control. Um, so, yeah, like, these are, I know it's not like the revolutionary techniques, um, but it's sometimes just about the little touches. And these are, you know, like some very easy little touches to pick up with in the context of techniques. But I also love little touches in the context of a bigger routine, you know? Thank you very much for those. Man, the cro <laughs> that cross cut thing, man, that is pure genius. I swear to God, that's how I'm going to do the cross cut <laughs> force from now on. That is amazing. And John Kerry will love that. I can't wait to show John that one. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So while, while you just, uh, you, you showed us some of your uh, original uh, subtleties, which I really liked, are you working on anything right now? You got any projects that you would like to talk about? Yeah, I, I have. Um, so currently what I am doing is I'm running a membership. I've started it some months ago. This membership is called Cartomagia, which I love. It's the Italian name for card magic. I'm, all the people got it very quickly. And I was like, well, this is Italian, but everyone knows it. It's card to much here. It's a place where I'm sharing my original magic. I upload two new tutorials each month. And uh, it's very affordable. It's like $9 for a month and you get two things. And you also get access to the big library of content. And currently, so what I'm doing is... Uh, focusing on the tricks for that project. Um, it features a lot of new tricks. It also features some updated versions of old tricks, such as the life, the lies tricks. Lies trick is going to be in there at one point. 
and uh, more techniques such as some of my never foreseen laughing work on switches and color changes and so currently because this conversation should be out in april i think so currently i'm running a, a free month trial for new subscribers so you know like if you are somebody who is not subscribed and wants to subscribe you can head over to my instagram profile and you'll find the link and you have a free month you know it's it's good do you have anything i always end an episode by giving the giving it to you and letting you say anything you want it can be a quote it can be a recommendation it can be just pure silence so i'll just pass <laughs> it to you and uh, you decide pure silence i love it um i'm not sure it's like um i loved this conversation i think people should watch this and you know uh, that that's great but um w- w- one tip um when i'm asked to give like one tip to like magicians is like be kind this is what i say be kind be kind to people be kind with yourself be kind with other magicians because like the magic world is great but there are also you know like not great people not great episodes and not you know like it's and i think especially when you're a kid and you're starting out magic and you're getting into this beautiful world the best gift you can have is not the best dribble pass in the world or the best double lift it is people that help you that truly help you and that want you to be the best of yourself and really want you to sort of be in the best form you can be um this is the best gift i've been given which is friends and magic that helped me so much and that gave me so many opportunities and um i know for sure that what i want to do as well is like be kind in, in myself as well and i feel like you know that might sound very cliche so we're we're ending the big conversation on on something very cliche but but to me is very deep is very personal and um magic also tends to feel like something that gives you superpowers or that gives you the center of that puts you at the center of the room like gives you attention from people um which is something I, i don't like of magic i'm not that kind of person and so sometimes we sort of take that power and forget that we're we're just human beings even if we can turn over two cards without showing their two uh there are people in the world that can do a lot of things that can impact our lives a lot more um so if we share this passion if if we call this art form art and i want to do that if we love this the best thing is we, we can do is to recognize that this is lovely this is fun and we need to be kind with uh you know like young magicians growing up and our audience and ourselves as well uh and even if uh i mean i cannot do a pass properly but i don't hate myself for that i'm like you see you know i'm like i know my skills i'm going to do them and and hopefully that creates a connection with your audience as well you need to you need to create a connection magic is a bridge that connects me to you to, to people so uh that is that is it they can't do a pass either so you got something in common <laughs> i know i know that's a, that's a great backup phrase if they're like oh i saw the thing you know like can you do it you cannot <laughs> i'm just joking <laughs> just joking no don't, don't, don't guys, say that don't say that <laughs> guys be kind check out jaco jacomos jacomo yeah right yeah jacomo jacomo's uh, membership Cartomagia, 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 Cartomagia. <laughs> it's probably filled with. It's most likely filled to the brim with amazing ideas. Be kind and like this video. Share it with people. Drop a comment. Let us know what your favorite part was from this episode. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Probably gonna have. Every time I say next episode, I just think of of uh, Eminem and Doctor Dre. <laughs> That thing goes on in my head. Love it. We're going to have James Went, we're going to have uh, Toby Hudson, so we got uh, more people in the pipeline, so be sure to check out. Hope you guys have an amazing day. Thank you, Giacomo, one Thank more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I loved it. I loved this conversation. I loved it. Thank you so much. Much love to everybody.